John has been an incredible influence uh, on me personally and on this program uh, specifically for today. And I want to thank you for that. Um, John was one of the first people that took a look at the beginnings of a blueprint of, of the program, trying to imagine another kind of design education. John also has an X school um, initiative that he does around the world in a kind of uh, alternative design education that maybe you can speak about um, f for, for a little bit. Anyway, extraordinarily grateful that you're here. Very happy that you finished another book, because I know how hard it is to finish books. Um, and a, a huge welcome uh, to you, John Thackeray. Alan is one of those wonderful people who always asks you painful questions. And one of the ones he asked me not two days ago is, how long did it take you to write this book? And I hadn't actually thought about it until that moment. And then it came, I said, oh my God, it's five years. And it's quite a short, it's not very long. And you may find that five years is a very long time to deliver something so slight. But actually, part of the work was making it slight, because my previous books have been kind of very wonderful, but rather heavy going. So and it's one of the, I'm one of those writers who it's very hard for me to kind of make it easier and lighter to read. So I've worked hard on that. But thank you for that difficult question, Ellen. I've, got, I've given my talk a curious title, but I hope it will become clear during the day, um, the hour that uh, I want to first begin with a health warning that if you've never thought of bioregions before and think this doesn't sound like my cup of tea, be reassured you are in the vast majority. I'm proposing something, namely a word for, called bioregion, which is about a new way of thinking about place-based design and the multitude of different things that we're all involved with um, in the framework of uh, what does a leave things better economy mean in practice? not just as a concept, but how do we turn all these words that are flying around about what the future needs to be into practice? And since you're designers of a, of course, radically new type, I'm hoping that you can, in the questions and so on afterwards, uh, help me make it clearer. So there's four parts. Um, firstly, uh, although it is my work is sort of optimistic, it's within the framework of a reformed Duma that I think it's necessary to have a brief reminder to ourselves of why things are febrile in the world and that it may seem calm at this particular moment in this spot. The world is a very uh, tumultuous place, to put it mildly. And that one of the reasons that many people feel despair is that they don't see anything very clear and positive as a means of uh, focusing their efforts. So I want to just begin to outline a story that connects lots of disparate things which is, for many people, and again, be reassured if you think this is flaky, utterly implausible. So my part two of the talk is called Signals of Transformation. And it's the kind of core part of my work is looking around the world for examples of people doing things to meet daily life needs of different kinds in ways that in and of themselves represent the, the germs or the seedlings of a very radical new way of doing things even if for the most part that's not at all what they have set out to do. Thirdly is the general subject of, okay, it's very nice to have lots of stories about cool grassroots projects, whatever they may be in different contexts, but in what way can one plausibly propose that all these small projects can connect together and be framed and be the compost for something which is a genuine alternative to the system that at the moment is destroying the world. And then finally, a kind of few words really about what does this kind of information mean in terms of a world of design practice in particular where we're all emerging from a culture of projects and actions and individual moments of creativity where actually what's needed is something that is ongoing. How do we imagine our work as designers or planners or clients for that matter where think the world is not divided neatly up into projects. So it's quite a big story, and if you get totally fed up, just tell me or interrupt with questions, but um, I just keep going. But I want to start with why I wrote the book and why I think we need something more than a generalized commitment to do less harm to the world. So um, that picture is the River Ganges in India. I've been going there for 25 years now. And as some of you will know, the Ganges is one of the wonders of the world in kind of 
hydrological systems at a continental scale, which has for um, infinities really been a kind of natural part of, the, of the, the ecological systems of India, but also has for families and farmers and fishers for literally thousands of years. It's not so much that they have stewarded it, but they have been the stewarded by the, the river Ganges as a deeply spiritual and uh, yeah, incredible, encompassing meaning to Indian culture generally. And so every time I go to that part of the world, I think, isn't it just wonderful? And I have no deep understanding of what I'm looking at other than this sense of thousands of years of kind of mutual relationship between human beings and this great system. So that was the context in which I came to uh, this with a young companion, a dusty crossroads. This is between... Kanpur, some of you know Mansi, uh, and, and uh, Lucknow in Uttar Pradesh. It's a long, dusty journey. And halfway through, there's this little crossroads, and there was this huge truck um, on which was a very loud and rather blaring video playing. And um, I'm, I'm showing you this picture, even though to my great distress, the cow that was also standing there is missing from the picture. But there was, I swear to you, a cow along with us rather early in the morning staring blankly at this screen, which was there to announce and to proclaim the um, imminent uh, breaking ground for something called uh, Trans Ganga High Tech City. And this is the, um, I'm going to just go one more, this is the picture of the, the billboard that was um, a couple of miles further down the, uh, the road that we were on, pronouncing the imminent building of this turnkey smart city of the future which was going to be a kind of wonder of the world. And the new admin Indian administration has, has made as a centerpiece of its economic policy building 100 of these cities. And the kind of McKinsey's and the, you know, the, the consultants of the world have done very good business drawing up plans and blueprints for these things. The only problem being that uh, they're based on a concept of progress and development and modernity which in my judgment and my experience is a very backwards looking one, namely that the only way for a place or a country or a community to do well in the world is by building things. This is the, uh, one of the pronouncements of the World Economic Forum, some of whose people obviously would be involved in the, the 100 high-tech cities plan. In the next 35 years, we will need to build the same amount of urban infrastructure as in the last 3,500 years. We must, we must. Um, quite why we have to do that is not made 100% clear. The main story being that this will provide, you know, a tremendous amount of work for the consultants and the construction companies that will do it. But the notion that building for the future is in some way um, an automatically virtuous thing to do is pretty deeply rooted in all our cultures, including emerging ones like um, India's. And then after we watched this video, and this is a still from the video, my young companion said, you know, may the odds be forever in your favor. And I didn't, I had no idea what she was saying, to be honest, that this, you will recognize this from Hunger Games, is the guy is welcoming people to take part in the games where everybody will die except one person, and saying how lucky they are to be in it. That's what my young companion thought when seeing the billboard for Trans Ganga High Tech City. And then I got back on my journeys and took me to London, and uh, this is George Osborne, who is called the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's like the number two guy in the British government. And they are themselves, just like in India, launching and making a big song and dance about the sheer scale of the construction and infrastructure projects that they are committed to, using the language that this is not just about the self-interest of me in the short term, but about is fundamental rights of the future generation to a better world caused by and represented by these big infrastructure projects. I'm not prepared to turn around to my children and say, I'm sorry we didn't build for you. I kind of think he should, should say, I'm not prepared to turn around to the construction industry and say, oh, sorry we didn't build to you. But anyway, that's me being a cynical person. But he's true to his word. And here in the centre of London is one of the already underway projects. It's called uh, Crossrail. This is like 100 yards from where I used to have an office in, in London many years ago. A an extraordinarily brilliant piece of technology, engineering, planning, not to mention clever financing, public-private uh, partnerships and so on. 
uh, the whole city is kind of in uproar as they build this high-speed train right through the center of this very old city. And at no point now, then, or in the future has anybody said, why do, is it necessary to bring the farthest corners of the country closer to the center of the city with such an expensive thing? It's just absolutely not part of the debate about whether this is a desirable way to reorganize space and time. It's just, well, it must be good because it creates jobs. It creates holes in the ground. We are building for our future. And so I, although I'm being sort of cynical and I'm rude about it, and I think it's, to me, obvious that uh, massive infrastructure projects are not the way to create a better future, particularly those hard ones, I do think we have a responsibility to the next generations of Mr. which Mr. Osborne was speaking to say, okay, well, if we're, if we're critical or skeptical that heavy infrastructure is a, what we're building for, what is our alternative? What can we give to those guys by way of a, a description of what a better future will mean that is not the traditional and very sad description of what things that are green or sustainable or resilient or transitional, it always sounds small, feeble, sad, and not generally inspiring. So the basic framework for the book and for my work and generally is that we do have to be a bit more um, responsible for creating a, uh, not, a, not a, an image, not a vision, not a utopian fantasy, but a practical description of what a better work will be, a better world will be like, so that all these follower generations will actually be turned on and transform the, the details of it. Um, to our amazement. And I think the elements are there. So that is why I think a new story is needed. We need a new story which is as evocative and as exciting as infrastructures and rails and high-speed trains and large, shiny and expensive things. The general subject of reconnecting with place, of finding out qualities of where we live and exist that have become ignored or we've been distracted from paying attention to them, is an essential part of what the new story can be and what I'm going to tell you about in my, in my examples. A second part is the fundamental need but also excitement of reconnecting cities with the places from which their um, resources come. The notion that uh, the hinterland, the, the, the fields, the river systems, the uh, the lands upon which cities depend for their next lunch, but we don't, cities don't think about, that reconnection is unavoidably uh, going to be part of a resilient future. But the point is that reconnection needs to be more than just an ideological one or a cozy idea. How do, do we reconnect the city and all of you guys living for the most part in it with the natural systems upon which we depend for our next lunch, not to mention our whole lives? Well, that's a whole pile of interesting questions which I can come on to. But then thirdly, it's not just about a romantic wish to reconnect with the countryside, it's transforming our understanding of what is the built and what is the natural world. And that's one of the big transformations in the environmental movement is this final acceptance, learning from science as well as some wisdom traditions that cities are part of nature too. Just because we're living in cities doesn't mean to say we're not living in nature, it's just that we're living in a different aspect of nature. So when we talk about transforming cities for the better and making cities healthy and making uh, cities um, more connected to their resource bases, this does not require us to kind of sever all routes and then head off to some damp and unpleasant farm somewhere. It's something that happens here and there, and I'll talk about that in the examples. So we need a new story that helps us to understand why we are creative, why we do innovative uh, projects, why we research things. Towards what end, excuse me, do we do that? So before I kind of revisit the frame or the narrative, let me just show you why it is that against all the evidence that you would think would make uh, one very depressed and in despair, I'm quite optimistic, which is to say the thousands of examples of where very unlikely people and places are showing signs of reconnecting with things that have previously been not on the agenda. The general subject of the soils without which we would all fin be finished in a very short period of time. Last three or four years has been a, you know, lots of education activities and information posters like these brilliant guys. That are, have they been here, the lexicon people? 
who tell the story of things that we take for granted, but in a rather nice, light way. That has been at the level of communication and transformation quite powerful. But what I hadn't realized until uh, last summer in Sweden was that there's a kind of much deeper personal and kind of visceral connection waiting to be made that doesn't require a huge amount of intervention to make it happen. So this is a group of 44 architects, designers, urbanists, planners, a couple of managers, a couple of policy makers who came to our summer school. Alan mentioned it at the beginning, we do this X school format in which people come together to do a strange task in a place. And my question to this group at the beginning of a week on an island of, uh, in, called Grinda in uh, Sweden was, under what circumstances would a hardcore group of hipsters like you lot take the soils seriously? And they said, mm hmm And that was on the Sunday afternoon. And then on the Friday morning, they came back. They'd broken into groups. They'd gone scurrying around the island. And they said, OK, here is our answer to your question. And without any words being spoken, they introduced this ceremony in which basically what they'd done was to go around the island and find um, plants and berries and roots and twigs that uh, had some nutritional quality to them. They made a tisane out of those, and they put the tisane on the table, which you can see there, and then next to it a, 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 a wine glass with a sample of the soil from which the plant had grown. And the exercise was going along the road taste the Cezanne and put your finger in the soil, start to compare the taste of the soil and see if you could begin to kind of get a language of smell and taste and uh, perception of soil qualities that had not been there before. And it was so powerful, it was really a, just a very moving moment because this to me was probably the hardest, most skeptical group I could imagine. And it was, but it's like pushing at an open door with a very little finger and psh, off they went. This is why I am very optimistic that reconnecting with the biosphere, not just intellectually, but physically and emotionally and culturally, is something we all kind of yearn for, but just need to have a little space created for that. Others, it has to be said, are less subtle about it. This is the de-paving movement. This is uh, one of my stories that shows to me how fast things are changing. So have you heard of de-paving? Has everybody heard of it? No, no, okay. Deep, five, six years ago, activists and artists who believed that um, Mother Earth was being brutally imprisoned by capitalism and with the, the, the form of the prison which was paved surfaces and concrete and asphalt, started to go around digging up the car parks in Walmarts and places like that as acts of protest against the, this sort of persecution and imprisonment of Mother Earth. Five, six years ago, tops that was. Now, in about seven or eight cities, starting admittedly with Portland, but in other places as well, deep paving is now part of an official mainstream urban policy called how to welcome stormwater, um, how to manage it other than by building large, heavy infrastructures. So in other words, what began as a kind of artist's kind of fantasy has in less than five years started to become notion of uh, how cities will become softer and more resilient in the tempestuous weather that's arrived. So depaving is just an example you know, what, at the other extreme. Here are some people in uh, Tucson called the Watershed Management Group. They too are with their own hands digging, in this case, berms. They, uh, they actually they did, a, they were environmental science students who realized when they were uh, doing their studies that if they were gonna wait for the government or the city or some other person to do the work necessary to prepare their streets and their cities for the radical climate changes that were happening, they would be waiting a long time. So they formed themselves into volunteer groups and started doing it themselves, attaching rainwater tanks, uh, big digging soils for the rain to kind of stay in the locality and so on. Now they're all, I think they're in eight or nine states, and five, six years again down the line, what began as a very kind of weird fringe activity bunch of kind of science students is now beginning to become supported by city government to say this is actually pretty helpful and the city starts to help with you know ordinances and the kind of legislation side of things so what began again as a fringe activity in response to necessity is now becoming mainstream has anybody here planted trees oh look at that marvelous see 
That's how long ago was tree planting a fringe activity? Not so long. 600 million people in China planted at least one tree last year. Six, it's half the population. And they just, it's massive, massive all over the world. People saying, we don't want to just sit here and complain and feel the grief at the desperation of the natural world. Can we go and do something in practice? So all over the place, reforestation. But I wanted to kind of emphasize throughout my comments today that I'm so far back to the land, you know, hippies digging holes in car parks, yeah, I know, but I want to make a very strong plea that this shift in that side of things is connected to a shift in the world which may be more familiar to you guys, namely the shift towards making things rather than being consumers of things made by other people. They're both, but it looks, the context are different, but the maker movement is such a I'm not really, a, well, Alan will tell you that, I'm not a kind of natural maker, but I am a student of cultural phenomena, and it is amazing to me just the sheer scale and the variety and the depth of making activities in the last generation or less. And so what began as um, an, a, a remarkable kind of weekend thing in which people and their kids would go and make stuff is now, again, percolating horizontally into the way that people think about economic development. So, by way of a small piece of evidence for that project in Scotland, this is called uh, MakeWorks. These are fairly hardcore environmentalists who spent a lot of time, amongst other things, planting forests, who discovered that unless the planting of forests and the rescuing of hills and trees is accompanied by a rethinking of the economy so that people can have some prospect of livelihoods where they live rather than planting trees and then going back to the city to do something else. They say, what could we have to draw on by way of resources for an economy in which we make our own stuff uh, rather than being reliant on it from somewhere else? And so MakeWorks is uh, just a very wonderful project in which they have amazed themselves and each other and the kind of the, the places they visit by discovering this whole amazing network or archipelago of small workshops, people with skills. This is like one step, you know, more professional than the total amateur maker movement. And beginning to say, well, by the way, we have this incredible resource of people who are, um, thought they were working for the international oil business or for aviation or for IT companies, but by the way, they have skills and machines. Let's see if we can reuse what they're for. Have you had these guys here? Farm hack? You know farm hack. This is great. So there's two or three... It is, I must say, a curiously politically sort of fractious community, the people who make things for farms. I don't quite understand it. Open source technology, you know about. Anyway, there's a whole subset called why is it such a wonderful thing caused so much kind of ill feeling. Anyway, the point being, there's lots of ways in which people are saying, we can make stuff because it's cool, or we can make something that looks, feeds our cat to, without us having to get out of bed. Maybe the world is going to survive without that, but there is going to be a period when we need lighter and better ways of physically growing food are the forms of hacking, making, and DIYing that could be useful to the, the new farmers? Answer, that's why farm hack was started. There's 50 kind of groups now working on basic equipment needs that we have. So planting trees, digging berms, okay, that's kind of hippie-ish. Uh, hacking and DIYing, that's kind of fairly um, traditional maker stuff. I think the most remarkable of the kind of do DIY movement is in the, in the, in, when looking at the internet and communications themselves. So I don't know what it's been like here in much detail, but I know that in Spain and great swathes of southern Europe, the economic crisis has been so dramatic that it has become just impossible for regular people to have access to the internet because the kind of commercialization and the kind of costs of entry and et cetera. So well, you know that story. But what's just remarkable is there are now three or four rather large-scale citizen mesh network DIY internet programs going on. This is GUI, which is a big chunk of that part of Spain, in which basically five or ten people can get together and buy the kind of kit, or I physically make it themselves, and stick it on a roof, and then, then various people make the software for them to connect together. But for like a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost of a so-called industrial internet, you're getting this kind of rather rapid growth of coverage um, in a totally parallel internet caused by the fact that the kind of regular commercial grown-up internet is no longer accessible to poor people, which in Spain 
Portugal, Italy, Greece, and many other places is an increasing part of the population. But rather than saying, oh my God, somebody must do something, they're just physically building a parallel internet. It's quite amazing. So there you have uh, these signals of transformation, digging the trees, uh, connectivity, making stuff. It all begs the question, what about the kind of big narrative, you know, globalization, neoliberalism, capitalism, surely the whole system is far too all-encompassing and powerful for us to have any chance with our little projects of replacing it. And so, and in particular, the economic thinking, so the notion that every time you turn on the television or open a paper, the only word that seems to connect everybody is the need to grow, growth, expansion, all these words, or build things and grow. And then I went to this uh, meeting in uh, Bristol two weeks ago called the, Real, the Bristol New Economy Summit. You can look, that's a 15 there. Um, where they had 200, 220 people who are, I mean, I would not normally voluntarily go into a room full of economists at all, let alone for two days. But these are sort of economists, but they're basically a, a whole variety of people. This is mainly European, but some from the Southern Hemisphere who are doing everything from money systems, exchange systems, sharing platforms, legislative proposals, a whole variety of soft and rather technically hard for me to understand things, but all in response to what they shared without any conversation is the imminent implosion of the financial system that should have died in 2008 but didn't. So this is just a group of people saying, these are our proposed alternative platforms, models, and techniques for reorganizing the way that we exchange things, ready for it to go when the, the, the thing happens. If you want to explore it, there's a new website called Real Economy Lab, and those are all examples of that stuff. Now, what I remember thinking for the last few years, and certainly when I was writing the book, is I get very stressed by my inability to understand which amongst all these competing visions for a sort of less ecocidal economy was going to be the right one. Who is, who is the winner? What is the kind of correct, you know, is it all these different words that are flying around? For the first time in my life, I decided I'm going to chill out because what they all shared in that room was it's good to have diversity of competing models and competing proposals because in, in a field, a healthy field or in a healthy ecosystem, you have lots of stuff going on. It's not all survival of the fittest in a kind of neat way. You have a lot of things put on the table. That's where we are in the transition from a fairly monolithic and gruesome economic system towards something else we don't know what the something else is, but we do know many of the parts of the tools and the kind of frameworks for the, for the new economy that's to come. And in particular, that it's not, it, I learned from them and talking to these guys, you don't have to choose at this moment between you know, one thing being right. This, it's like tribes in a non kind of violent competing sense. So the whole world of commoning, I mean, I've got a whole chapter in this book about commoning, but I find it very stressful and com confusing. Does commoning mean that there is no money in the world or no profit or no, no, kind of, uh, no private ownership of things? If you go and talk to commoners, they will all give you a different answer. This is fine. That is what the great weight has been lifted off my shoulders. The transition town movement, transition network, pretty radically different way of describing the future that they see unfolding from a kind of small town, grassroots kind of activist, tiny bit hippie-ish point of view. The peer-to-peer -peer movement is much more hardcore politics, uh, you know, fairly kind of coming from the kind of left, certainly in Europe and um, Latin America, but with a kind of design element in there called platform design, framework design, sort of systems thinking, meets a bit of old left politics. The whole local money thing, I mean, local money goes back for like 100 years. It's not a new, but there are several hundred groups designing local currencies, and they're all slightly different in their ideologies, if they have one at all, are different. Kind of argue endlessly about whether digital local money is the real thing. Lots of arguments about all sorts of stuff, but the point being this proliferation of local money as a form of replacement for global M nature killing money is good, bioregionalism, hackers, all that stuff. It's just, I'm reassuring myself, but maybe you, that if you're interested in what kind of economy 
is emerging from the chaos that surrounds us at the moment? The answer is not one, but a multitude. But these signals, entertaining and interesting as they might be, they certainly are to me, raise a question. Under what circumstances would your city reconnect with its bioregion? And uh, we'll come on to why. We'll want to do that a bit later. But at the beginning, if you remember, I said that we are disconnected from the living systems, not that we just depend on, but that we're part of, until we reconnect city, country, body, system, food, in a kind of better way, we're going to be constantly chasing our shadows. The bioregion is a kind of manageable framework in which we can imagine collaborating perhaps with people we don't necessarily agree with. So the circumstance, this is where we get into the notion of designing circumstances rather than designing solutions. And I have that, you know, if you, when you're doing systems thinking and systems design, systems in general don't stop changing. So the notion that you design a new one to replace the bad old one, it's, we have to find a way out of that kind of framework of thinking and saying we are in a multitude of interacting systems. We need to do things in it which causes them bit by bit maybe to behave differently. So in this transition from blindly staring at screens or running around with each other in cities to looking at the bigger picture, there's a whole range of interventions and actions that can be taken that change the behavior of the system without it necessarily being some very heavy systems thinking kind of activity in its own right. So everything we do changes the behavior of a system, a city, a bioregion, whatever. So it's to do with learning a bit of a sensitivity to the ways that things can change. So under what circumstances is the whole range of things um, that could change the behavior of the city in its bioregion? I don't know what you think about the word biodiversity. I find it rather perplexing. It's one of these very good but abstract words. It turns out, if you talk to kind of everything from biologists to historians and paleobotanists, this is my latest favorite niche specialism, that biodiversity is the interaction of living species in lots of different situations, including people, including cities. And you don't have to have some grand plan to make a city biodiverse because you can put into it all sorts of small interventions, like just last night at Uptown I saw, you know, a beehive on somebody's roof. That is a, an, an aspect of biodiversity, which by itself will maybe survive, maybe not, but that's something that's perfectly valid little pinprick. You've heard of the acupuncture theory. But so lots of cities are doing bits of these without necessarily having a plan for biodiversity. But what then becomes interesting is when, which is what uh, the ecological thinking says, is looking at the connections between patches or spots of biodiversity, connecting intense parts of life with other intense parts, which is, again, this is like this five-year kind of itch thing. So five years ago, a woman whose name has briefly escaped me in Seattle started doing a project called Pollinator Pathways, in which she said, well, we have to find ways to stop cities being kind of death star elements for butterflies and bugs upon which all life depends. And so her project was a uh, series of just discussions and planters, like, you know, a one square meter bed of flowers in which she sort of made a pathway across Seattle so that in principle and in practice, certain pollinators could make it across the city without perishing along the way. And then last week, which you all, of course, know, the US federal government passed a national uh, pollinator strategy. Did you know that? So that's like five years from one artist doing one project in Seattle. Then we had all this stuff about um, the kind of the death of the bees and so on. This is just me being very kind of cheered by the speed with which even very, you know, the federal government, for God's sake, locked in and owned by a special interest, has passed a pollinator policy, which is about basically requiring states and cities to do that kind of thing. So that's quite a fast change. I'm not pretending, I'm not kidding myself totally that tomorrow everything will suddenly be all right, but for the federal government to make that kind of shift in that kind of fairly radical direction I think is meaningful. The subject of design not being about putting new things into empty places, I'm very passionate about that and I'm sure you are. This particular story is when I realized that the notion of searching for things that are there but are invisible or neglected is such a powerful part of reconnecting with place, not in a kind of 
sentimental but in a practical way. So six years ago, I was uh, doing a biennial in France. Alan came to that, where the basic idea was, oh, John will bring all his clever friends from around the world to show us cool designs to make our region a green region of France. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, I just would like to know what is already happening here so we don't reinvent the wheel. And we then did a, an investigation about one river, which is the Furon, feeds into the Loire, which has been bashed about by mining, textiles, industrialization, motorways, you know, everything. And everybody assumed that it was a dead and or more or less moribund river. But in one piece of investigation, plus a couple of people who knew, we said, okay, what's happening on the ground that we should know about before we start bringing in John's clever friends to solve the whole problem? 46 projects we identified along that bit of river in which individuals, groups, butterfly fanatics, cooks who wanted to grow white garlic, wild garlic, there was a dating group that would tell you which tree they were going to have a date under, all sorts of things in which people who had a love for that river and for the place were doing little tiny activities, sometimes repairing a creek, sometimes organizing some kind of uh, you know, picnic arrangement, but all doing stuff now, not in the future, not after some big plan, called restoring the, the furor. So it totally transformed our understanding of what that biennial should be about. Namely, we should look for all these projects and say, how can we help them do better? How can we give them new qualities? How can we give them new tools? How we can then connect them to each other? We looked around that city for productive spaces that might have been overlooked as possible sites for growing food, uh, which turned out to be a lot, obviously. Um, but this is, uh, do you know about the Cleveland study? That is in the book, one of the most amazing. I do have a few uh, pieces of proper sort of evidence that surprised me in this. One is the Cleveland study into urban farming. So the mayor of Cleveland is a fairly unromantic guy who basically thought that this is some sort of hipster nonsense, this urban farming, and that please will somebody give me some evidence to prove this is a distraction from the real business of feeding our people, only to be amazed by a, quite a, a study which counted all the bits of Cleveland and its immediate surroundings within the city limits that could theoretically be used for growing food. And anyway, to cut a long story short, 70 to 80 percent of the the fruit, vegetables, dairy, eggs, and chickens eaten by Cleveland could, with a few interventions, be grown within the city limits and totally transform the meaning in terms of the bigger picture of urban farming. Where you need to bring in not just goodwill, but new platforms. So this is not Cleveland, this is later. This is a French project called La Rouche. It's a third generation community supported agriculture where a guy called Guillaume Chevron, who is an industrial designer and chef, terrific combination, said, I, why is it so sad and dis boring to have a box of sad vegetables delivered to your door from some farmer that I don't know, and where I have no choice, and I may not like kale anyway? Um, can, surely it can be done better. He invented a, uh, a sort of web platform in which up to 20 producers or farmers could put every week the food they had available and the price. The citizens could then place orders and then, this is the crucial thing, rather than having it delivered by whatever system to the people's doors, the people buying the food have to go and meet the farmers to collect their food. So in the same way he used a web platform to create this contact between hungry city people and food producers that is otherwise, we go on about it, where does our food come from? In the, with those things, you just go and ask the farmer, you know, why, why is, where did this potato come from and what about this uh, bacon and so on? And there's like, well, I don't know, there's 2,000 of these platforms now, they're going like crazy. I can't, there's a very interesting business model whereby basically the farmer uh, gives the money, the, the, you give the money directly to the farmer and the farmer rents the platform, so there's no intermediation in terms of the business model. So you know exactly the money you spend goes to the farmer and then a bit goes to pay for the platform and a couple of jobs associated with that. It's very brilliant, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice interface, but it's a beautiful piece of social innovation because Guillaume said, I want city people to meet the farmers and not just have some glorified online Whole Foods experience. I want to change the, the social dynamics of it. And it's really, I think, a perfect example of how what could arguably be described as an app can transform this city-countryside relationship. I learned a word along the way, orcharding. Have you heard of orcharding? Apparently, when you plant a fruit tree, it's called orcharding. This is in Scotland. 
I'm mainly showing you that because I like the picture, but also because it's a, another one of these pretty brutal, in this case in Scotland, post-industrial town where the simple act of planting fruit trees has created an extraordinary transformation of the self-confidence of the citizens to make stuff happen. Uh, this is in uh, the UK, and it's an example. I've got a, you know, hundreds of these, and you've done this yourselves. The notion of participatory design, it's for most of my working life as a design critic, people have found it you know, necessary but sad, a box to be ticked. But when it comes to the transformation of cities in terms of their relationship to living sy systems and food and so on, you have to have the participation of the citizens to bring it to life. And these clinics and sort of mapping exercises, what goes where, they're very powerful because they, it's, well, you know this better than me, I think, that the, the basic design principle of having a physical representation of a city and the actors in it, you can see where the gaps are and where there is a gap or some kind of bad connection, that is a design opportunity. You design something, a thing, a communication, an organization, a business model, to connect things that are separated, and come back to that in a minute. But you also need the tools, and this is a, one, some friends of mine in Bangalore, it's a very inspiring project in Bangalore where it's one of those Indian cities which that used to be called the city of a thousand lakes. Most of those lakes have disappeared under this kind of insane urbanization in India, except that two or three generations of people can still remember that the, uh, the, there were lakes there Maybe we should find out what their condition is now. And there's this whole wonderful movement of citizen science and citizen monitoring and citizen mapping in which the exploration of the city to find out where, what, was there a lake here? What, what is the state of it now? Has really very rapidly transformed the city's self-image in terms of what might be possible in bringing these lakes back to life and connecting the, to each other. I can tell you about that later if you like. I just love the way that they invented a notation system, they made tools, and they basically, these are kind of high school students for the most part, but the just act of going out into the world and seeing what is left of what was a dream for their parents, they have begun to say, why should we tolerate not having our legs back? And that's beginning to happen. Learning journeys, these are called appy roots in Slovenia. So if you're interested in bees, I'm kind of mildly interested, I'm not a bee fanatic, I have to say. There's lots of good people doing bees, but if you wanted to go on a bee journey, Slovenia has hundreds of people who are kind of very deeply expert in every conceivable aspect of bees and bee life and bee products. You can now go on a learning journey from Italy up into Slovenia, going to any number of different stops and spend a day or two days with some guy who's doing propolis, I know. Do you know about propolis? Who knows about propolis? So the propolis is an essence of something to do with bees, which is, I've been traveling a lot, and I take propolis every day, and I haven't got the cold yet. So that's one of the things that they do in Slovenia, which you would have to go on this journey to find out how to become a propolis master or mistress or something. These are my friends in uh, Lapland who do um, mosaic bread making. This is quite a widespread phenomenon. Why do we have to kind of rely for our bread on sort of grain or flour that comes from we know not what, where? This is one of the kind of many participants in a kind of network of grain, you know, bread makers, grain makers, and bakers that share the task, collaborate, but have these small enterprises. This is actually, since I know Alan is sitting there, this is actually something from France, but this is a real project in Lapland, where Lapland, 75% of every household in Lapland conserves food for the winter using some variety of fermentation or others which every kind of foodie on the planet says, we've got to do more, yeah, fermentation is the history of how we will survive. They are, or have done it for generations and they're still doing it. And so my friends in Riga are saying, after me badgering them for like three years about this is just amazing, it's amazing what you're doing, all this stuff, they're going to say, okay, well, if it's so amazing, we should maybe make the, uh, little journeys so you can go from house to house and grandmother to grandmother and farmer to farmer to see this incredible richness of the fermentation culture in its place which I think is a very superior form of tourism to the normal kind. Bread houses and bread routes in Bulgaria. Uh, anyway, that's that. So I started about this notion of a story that connects. We need a kind of something to aim for that is not building motorways or high-speed trains or big damaging projects that lead us to kind of accelerate our way into further difficulty. 
So that's what we're looking for. Secondly, I've shown you a whole bunch of people, you know, fermenters in Latvia, bee farmers in Slovenia, all these people doing very beautiful things that have potential and meaning for an alternative way of understanding inhabiting the Earth, but you could arguably say they're rather tiny and meaningless compared to the Walmartization of the world. How do we move from the small to the big? We have, I think, we can be confident that social innovation is everywhere. That's the kind of story of the last 10 years. It's not something we have to create out of thin air. We need to connect with people who are doing things to meet daily life needs in novel manner. What is more interesting is that what researchers describe as social, eco social ecological systems, which is one of these dreadful words that so researchers use, is actually coming to life in all these projects to do with forests, streams, creeks, riverbed, biodiversity projects. People are organizing in new ways socially in order to connect with and restore and steward natural assets in different ways, and that's the furon. So many of the requirements that the climate scientists and the transition experts say need to be met are being met now. But the scale thing is still the challenge. How might design shape all these small things in a way that the, the total is bigger than the sum of the parts? So in the bioregional history, uh, it is not a new subject. So if any of you have studied or even heard of the word before, it's a 40-year-old narrative called uh, we should reconnect with the way that the land naturally organizes itself rather than arbitrarily drawing squares and lines across the landscape. So Cascadia, which is the Pacific <coughs> Northwest, has been a kind of word and a, has a plan and a kind of logo and everything going back for 35, 40 years to the 1970s for sure. There are examples in uh, different parts of the U.S. where groups map, speculate, and dream about how their, their state or their region could be reimagined in terms of its relationship to natural systems rather than traditional economic or political boundaries. This is uh, some friends of mine in South Devon. Somewhere in there is the Schumacher College, which is a you know, rather famous small college where they're figuring out what does it mean to reorganize the South Devon watershed as the center for imagining the development of that part of England. And I should not forget to mention there's a course there in April, if you're keen, a two-week course on bioregional development, where they're going to do that in practice. It's one of probably 30 or 40 similar projects around Europe that have this kind of place as bioregional focus. This is in Germany, where some people at Linz are making a kind of multi-scalar, multi-geographical, multi-economic activity sort of a plan and space for the, this part of Germany. This is, I'm running a bit short of time, I'll jump over that, but there's a very, for those of you who like incredibly complex eye candy process charts, that's one of the states of the art. This is the eight levels of a bioregion, but I'm, I don't have enough time to do that. The point being, but what's different about those 40 years of imagining the bioregion as something, we, we, the world is bad, we need something more beautiful, let's have a bioregion. That's sort of to grossly oversimplify. Unless the vision, the planning, and the practice, and the implementations we do connect the social, the ecological, and the economic, then we're going to be stuck in just, not wishful thinking, but we're not going to make the breakthroughs in terms of scale and impact that we might be looking for. And so that is, uh, to come to the last part, what the book has uh, done is to say, okay, these cult projects are very nice, but in what ways can we group them together in which we create a social e ecological system on some kind of regional scale so that it has a meaning which is different than the bits? And I'll show you three examples of how that works in practice. Food, I keep talking about food, but I don't need to apologize for that. You all know the world is filled with zillions of food projects, but at the end of the day, now in New York, I suppose, two or three percent of people eat kind of real food, and it's only they're rich people for the most part. What can we do to not just to talk about food systems as a cool subject, but to actually have a design strategy for bringing them into existence in a healthy way? One answer for the last period is to say, well, what do these things look like? And my friends in California have done this very brilliant. Maybe you've been shown that by others, Nourish. 
This is a kind of biospherical scale representation of food systems, which is cool and amazing, but at the end of the day, it's not so obvious to me anyway how, what to do with that, that picture. It's nice, but you can hang it on the wall and feel virtuous, but it doesn't really lend itself to being acted on. It gets a bit easier when you break that down into the subsystems of food, and I talked about, you know, Cleveland can measure the amount of spaces that it has that could be transformed into productive spaces, then a whole variety of practical things can be done to make that happen. You're getting a bit further towards a system that you can intervene in. But I think that the thing really comes to life when you, so to speak, zoom in and look at the actors and the actions and the relationships in something called a food system for your place. Now, I slightly invented this. The actual dots in the network is from an actual project in Denmark, but I rather quickly plonked these pictures on just to represent the notion of the actor in a food system. It can be New Amsterdam Market. It could be a grower. This is in Fresno. This is a food truck in London. People doing things with food that, and the question is, when you're looking at it as a designer or a systems intervener is, is this food truck guy connected to this farmer? of greens or to the pig guy, yes or no, because that means closing the loop, making things close, and then localizing food production. <coughs> when the answer is no or not well or with difficulty, that's a design opportunity. I talked about the service platforms that begin to do that in lots of interesting different ways, but all of these things are still incomplete without some kind of system-wide framework that looks at the kind of the money, the government, and the kind of, the, the kind of regulation of the system from a sustainable point of view. So the food commons, which started in Fresno and is now in four US cities and a few others in other countries, is an explicit design project to create the framework for a food system that looks at all these activities that are found in a food system, which for the most part, you know, all sorts of people do them, 30,000, different companies in Britain are just involved in distribution, for example. You have a multiplicity of actors. If you then said, okay, how do we then make a kind of regional food economy in which the bits that uh, interact with each other are interacting locally? In order to do that, you need to have money, organization, legal frameworks. And so I'm kind of slightly kind of galloping over this. Check out the food commons. They won the Buckminster Fuller Prize a couple of years ago. They are the people who, and they didn't win, they were finalists, who are saying it is a design action to create a system-wide framework with money systems, with governance. And what's quite fascinating is that they actually do say it costs $100 million to make a food system for Fresno, which sounds impossible. But they are now talking to, you remember those new economy people I showed you half an hour ago? They're talking to the new money, the new economy, new capital people who are finding green money and so you're beginning to get that connection between two very diverse groups of people saying, oh, by now we have a project. We can make a food system for Fresno, and by the way, it's going to cost $100 million, but that's absolutely doable. And that's within three years that transition has taken place. Moving. So basically, uh, I would like to go on a rant about driverless cars, but I, luckily for you and me, we don't have time. But I did go to a meeting in uh, Vienna like a, a month ago where a pretty mind-blowing meeting where all the people who are involved in what's something called mobility as a service met together, which is basically about, rather than kind of thinking too over much about roads and vehicles and all that stuff, we think about how do we you know, m activate and access all the different mobility resources that are already there, trams, roads, cars, through our smartphone as the kind of device that uh, connects us with an integrating system. Uh, and the amazing thing about that was that this is uh, becoming real right now. The, these are the Belgian guys who talked about cloud commuting. So the basic design story is why buy or build or own a car when you can use something that already exists. And all those little badges along the top are about the different functions that that little van could fulfill when you mobilize it to do something. That's so far so good. That was two and a half years ago, that cloud commuting project was a pure speculation. And then that one month ago in Vienna, this is a diagram of a live project in a town in Finland where some companies that are dealing with this integration 
business uh, actually making a live example of a city where nobody will own anything at all in terms of the physical bits of infrastructure. The city will be the proprietor of the, of the kind of platform and mobility will be a service enabled by and provided by the city and the services accessing all the different bits, you know, vehicles and bridges and cars and so on. Uh, it's very complex and the, the big, biggest argument is whether this is something you, uh, so to speak, subcontract to Daimler who in the case of Movil, Daimler, big car companies, they've realized that cars are on the way out, so they said we better find out what our next game is going to be, and, and integrating mobility platforms seems to be their thing, or Google, whatever. The problem being that if you allow a company to do it, then it is no longer a public service, it's a paid-for service, and the big the, the discussion in Vienna was, do we want to privatize the provision of mobility as a service? Maybe we don't. And then the kind of the thing that tipped the argument was when we said, well, it's, if we stay just thinking about mobility as something which enables us to move around the city with as little friction and s as seamlessly as possible, then we will just amplify the amount of mobility that exists in the world and we will become less rather than more sustainable. We need a second algorithm called mobility, which is 20 times lighter in total aggregate impact than it is today which is another one of these big stories, but is, to cut a long story short, Germany and Austria collaborating on a program of radically dematerializing urban freight in which various different sorts of cargo bikes, together with that kind of infrastructure and the reorganization of various things, they know they can, they can, they can get rid of 90% of white vans and trucks from the cities of Europe with this kind of infrastructure. But you, have, you can't do that if you leave that to a commercial service provider like Daimler-Benz because they don't have an interest in that. They have a different interest. So this is the big fight happening at the moment. So this is a kind of soup delivery service in uh, Zurich, by the way, which is one of the first, they call them factor 20 urban services where the provision, I just went up for soup with Alan. I don't know what it costs to run and operate a store here in Manhattan, but in their case, it's 20 times less resources per unit of soup eaten by me compared to having a soup kitchen or a restaurant or something like that. So insofar as we need to make a much more radical transition from the way that cities work now, these are the little micro examples. This is the sort of begin to the systematization. And then the third element is when the cities start to become confident to see themselves as principles in that. Do you know about main sale freight? Farmers who said, how do we get the, our products to the cities where there are hungry rich people without using trucks and expensive ways of getting there? Answer, they've got this beautiful boat. It's an experiment that this is, you know, farmer-enabled new transportation. And I'm going to have to gallop through here the uh, last story because it's, I've run out of time. I want to go back to the last bit. We've gone from the need for a new story, the need for... Uh, connecting the bits in ways in which the bigger picture has a different meaning. How does this relate to the kind of lives that we're expecting to have as designers or activists or whatever, citizens? How can we imagine this kind of work having some kind of meaning and coherence on it in a bigger scale so that we're not just dashing around looking for alternatives at random? Is there a sense in which the task of thinking bioregionally thinking about the city and its life support systems, can that become a meaningful framework for a career or a life in a designerly way? Well, the answer is yes, but we have to kind of move away from the idea that this is a fixed destination. This is something we call a courgette chart in, uh, in the doors of perception world. I quite just, it's the notion that, yes, we will carry on doing the things that we know and are taught to do in brilliant schools like this, mapping actors or designing prototypes and business, all that stuff. But that will never stop. It's not something we do have a kind of five-year program and then do it and then stop. We have to reimagine our work and our lives and our kind of tra trajectories through space and time and geographies in which this stuff is happening all the time. Which I hope gives you a op sense of optimism that there's actually probably more to do than you realized. Uh, certainly I'm realizing that. I have no clear idea about whether there are actual jobs associated with a lot of this stuff. There is work. Yes, jobs is a slightly separate problem. But anyway, as I say, um, 
I am a happier person at the end of reading it, writing it, stupid me. Um, I think there are a lot of possibilities there, but I stand to be enriched and instructed by you guys. So I, I'm going to stop. Sorry for running a bit late, but um, yeah, thank you. Well, I want to thank you because I, I, I just, Cascadia was the first thing I heard about when I started to say, what is a bioregion? And everybody said, well, go. And, and you've had this incredible range. You have the universities with programs. You have people with 30 years' experience. But for some reason, it's never expanded outside that geographical reason, region. Do you have any, what, what, how do you explain that? I think things like flags are, when, are as important as you know, everything else, because that means it's real. Where I live in France, there's, uh, the government is reorganizing the, the structure of regions, and they have decided, in an act of absent-mindedness, to ask the populace what they want to call their new region, which is bigger than the one before. And where I live, it's called Occitanie. And so, the, but this is a, it's a bit like Catalonia. It's a sort of separatist, independent, own language, own culture. And everybody, 90% of people said, okay, we'll be called Occitanie, thank you so much. And the government has absent-mindedly created a huge political problem for itself by giving us the opportunity to have our own flag and our own language, which has, by the way, been there for hundreds of years anyway. So symbols have this very weird power. According to Thackeray's third law, which is things happen when they're ready to happen, not when people like me say so. So, you know, who knows when it's going to happen. Well, I think it's a very important question, and I, we, we'd obviously be very foolish to underestimate the power of corporations to be sensitive to their own survival. So I don't know that, and I'm not saying it'll be easy. In Spain, what has happened is that the, the economy is so wrecked that the corporations don't see any kind of, they don't have, feel economically threatened by this alternative system because it's very cheap, so relatively low, uh, kind of low, it's not sophisticated, and they're not losing vast amounts of money that they would otherwise get had they not controlled it and owned it. So I don't, I don't, so in the city centers, it's can be contested. But in terms of these vast areas of Spain where you have 50, 60% unemployment and where young people are totally not franchised and they're not in a position to pay money to the to corporate companies, it's sort of, in a weird way, a kind of parallel system. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you, am I voting for Donald Trump, you mean? I don't know. <laughs> I can't, I, 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 I'm just totally confused about I have chosen in my own world to look for, in my own life, people who are the voices of and articulating this kind of nebulous, grassroots but not totally grassroots, connected but kind of bottom-up movements. And I tend to find the most inspiring voices are not people who are fighting their way through mainstream politics, you know, like Bernie Sanders or Corbyn in England, those sorts of people. They're kind of symptoms of a crisis of the traditional system, but the most in sort of articulate and convincing voices are those who aren't attempting to kind of, you know, to get democratic office. There's a guy called Antonio Savater in Spain, for example, who just talks with great eloquence about the power of small groups organizing, spontaneously reforming, and explaining why when, for example, the M15 movement goes quiet in Spain, it's not that it's disappeared or died, they've just decided not to go and get themselves beaten up by the police for a couple of years whilst they go and form local committees and start schools and start farms and everything else. So there's a gigantic amount out there, and if one just looks at kind of representative pro politics as where the next system will come from, I think one would, the danger is you miss the next thing. I'm, this is another criticism of people who are active in mainstream politics. Somebody's got to do that. It's just not me. I did that when I was a young lad. Yeah. I think it's just where we have coexisting worlds in which the existing pol politics knows that it's in a sort of death spiral but doesn't have me. I, I just I tell you when I, the moment at which I realized that I had no skills or interest in trying to going to mainstream politics is when I went to a meeting at the Houses of Parliament in England about peak oil about four years ago. And there's a guy called Charlie Hall, who's an American professor, who's very expert on explaining that it's not about the oil running out, it's about the cost of the oil goes up and up when the kind of, you know, that gets more and more difficult to get it, and that capitalism needs a very, you know, lots of cheap energy in order to expand, in order to pay its debts. Anyway, 
90 minute presentation to all these kind of lawmakers, at the end of which he sat down and this kind of very kind of glossy man stood up and said, well, ah, this is very, very, pause for thought, Professor Thorpe, pause for thought. Of course, uh, we, no elected uh, official can possibly confront his um, constituency with the prospect of reduced living standards. We would be voted out in a week. And then he sat down. And then Charlie Hall said, well, I, I'm a numbers guy, I'm not a policy guy, and so I don't know what to do about that. Then he sat down, and then we all went home. And so that was the moment when I realized that this is ridiculous, because the, 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 the action is not here. They, are, they have power, they can wreck the place, they can have wars, they can do all sorts of terrible things, but at the end of the day, the sources of the recomposition of the economy is not going to come from that environment, it just isn't. So you, Bernie Sanders or Corbyn, all these people are symptoms of something unlocking, so quite a healthy sign, I think, but they are not going to be the leaders of a new world, they're just not going to be, they can't. Not, they're not bad people, they just can't, yeah. I know. That's, uh, so you've read that bit, haven't you? There's an amazing, I, there's a guy called Robert Newworth, and he's, a, he, I don't know if he's in New York, but you should get him to come, he's amazing. Wrote a book called The Stealth of Nations, uh, which is all about the growth and composition of the informal economy, which is the bit of the economy where you don't have a job, but you get by doing all sorts of bits and pieces. And the amazing thing about the informal economy is that according to the OECD, it's going to be 60 to 70 percent of working age adults in the entire world will be informal by 2020, which is a hell of a lot of people, uh, which actually means that probably 35, 30 percent of people have jobs and careers and pensions and credit cards. So there's this weird kind of imbalance five in five years from there. Well, we're like pretty much there now, yeah. Um, and so the point being that that's the informal economy called work that we recognize as work. Then you have the informal economy called the household economy, the whole thing of looking after children or our loved ones and each other, the whole of social stuff which has never been described as economic at all, which is like vast, obviously. And there's a very interesting um, German philosopher called Ina Pistorius who suddenly written a couple of books saying, well, by the way, if the task of, if sustainable means st stewarding and caring for the earth and ourselves in ways that are not destructive through the economy, and if like two-thirds of the work that we do already is unpaid care work, maybe the purpose of the economy is care rather than something called GDP. And so she suddenly, I think, unlocks an amazing sort of positive way to think about the informal, or the, she calls it the care economy, that's why I put it on that list, that if caring is our fundamental sort of value for each other and for the planet, then we then, that is so obviously the right way to have priorities, then we have to just redesign the stuff that, you know, the economic categories, the money systems and everything else, that will naturally follow. So I think that she's one of those people who says that the transformation is happening, but it hasn't had a word attached to it yet. There isn't a party or a leader or a kind of a representative of this new way of thinking and being, but it's out there in a million examples. Stewardship is, what do you think? Do you like the word stewardship? Does it turn you on, stewardship? Some people say it sounds a bit like running a club. So in English, I have trouble in England because the steward is the person who, I, I don't want to admit, I think it's a great word, stewardship. I think caring is a good word, and uh, all these words are good, but just that I think there's a danger we're looking for the one word that we attach to everything, and that saying we are now moving from the eco side, you know, the bad, the good is called caring or stewarding or whatever. Uh, Somebody other than me will maybe come up with the one, the one word, I don't know. I'm not sure that having one word corresponds to the diversity, which is the natural quality of this thing that's happening. I think living in a box underneath Brooklyn Bridge is probably the most likely destination for somebody <laughs> like me. I, I, um, I don't know if my place, I'm a chronic example of somebody who moves around too much and, you know, and every time somebody says you're going shallowly into lots of different things, I'm totally guilty of that. And so I do have a life, I have a life in, in a home in France and a proper place where I would desperately think I should spend all my time and um, one day I will no doubt do that. I'm basically a connector and a kind of storyteller so that task is for lots of people to do in different ways and I've been doing it a long time. So I'm not going to easily stop doing that, I don't think. Many thanks, John. Okay.
spot. The world is a very uh, tumultuous place, to put it mildly. And that one of the reasons that many people feel despair is that they don't see anything very clear and positive as a means of uh, focusing their efforts. So I want to just begin to outline a story that connects lots of disparate things, which is, for many people, and again, be reassured if you think this is flaky, utterly implausible. So my part two of the talk is called Signals of Transformation, and it's the kind of core part of my work is looking around the world for examples of people doing things to meet daily life needs of different kinds in ways that in and of themselves represent the, the germs or the seedlings of a very radical new way of doing things, even if for the most part that's not at all what they have set out to do. Thirdly is the general subject of, okay, it's very nice to have lots of stories about cool grassroots projects, whatever they may be, in different contexts, but in what way can one plausibly propose that all these small projects can connect together and be framed and be the compost for something which is a genuine alternative to the system that at the moment is destroying the world. And then finally, a kind of few words really about what does this kind of information mean in terms of a world of design practice in particular where we're all emerging from a culture of projects and actions and individual moments of creativity where actually what's needed is something that is ongoing. How do we imagine our work as designers or planners or clients for that matter where think the world is not divided neatly up into projects? So it's quite a big story and if you get totally fed up just tell me or interrupt with questions but um, I just keep going. But I want to start with why I wrote the book and why I think we need something more than a generalized commitment to do less harm to the world. So um, that picture is the River Ganges in India. I've been going there for 25 years now. And as some of you will know, the Ganges is one of the wonders of the world in kind of hydrological systems at a continental scale, which has for um, infinities really been a kind of natural part of, the, of the, the ecological systems of India, but also has for families and farmers and fishers for literally thousands of years. It's not so much that they have stewarded it, but they have been the stewarded by the, the river Ganges as a deeply spiritual and uh, yeah, incredible, encompassing meaning to Indian culture generally. And so every time I go to that part of the world, I think, isn't it just wonderful? And I have no deep understanding of what I'm looking at other than this sense of thousands of years of kind of mutual relationship between human beings and this great system. So that was the context in which I came to uh, this with a young companion, a dusty crossroads. This is between Kanpur, where some of you know Mansi, uh, and, and uh, Lucknow in Uttar Pradesh. It's a long, dusty journey, and halfway through there's this little crossroads, and there was this huge truck um, on which was a very loud and rather blaring video playing. And um, I'm, I'm showing this picture, even though to my great distress, the cow that was also standing there is missing from the picture, but there was, I swear to you, a cow along with us rather early in the morning staring blankly at this screen, which was there to announce and to proclaim the um, imminent a breaking ground for something called uh, Trans Ganga High Tech City. And this is the, um, I'm going to just go one more, this is the picture of the, the billboard that was um, a couple of miles further down the, uh, the road that we were on, pronouncing the imminent building of this turnkey smart city of the future, which was going to be a kind of wonder of the world, and the new admin Indian administration has as made as a centerpiece of its economic policy building 100 of these cities and the kind of McKinsey's and the, you know, the, the consultants of the world have done very good business drawing up plans and blueprints for these things. The only problem being that uh, they're based on a concept of progress and development and modernity which in my judgment and my experience is a very backwards looking one namely that the only way for a place or a country or a community to do well in the world is by building things. This is the, uh, one of the pronouncements of the World Economic Forum, some of whose people obviously would be involved in the, the 100 high-tech cities plan. 
In the next 35 years, we will need to build the same amount of urban infrastructure as in the last 3,500 years. We must, we must. Um, quite why we have to do that is not made 100% clear. The main story being that this will provide, you know, a tremendous amount of work for the consultants and the construction companies that will do it. But the notion that building for the future is in some way um, an automatically virtuous thing to do is pretty deeply rooted in all our cultures, including emerging ones like um, India's. And then after we watched this video, and this is a still from the video, my young companion said, you know, may the odds be forever in your John has been an incredible influence uh, on me personally and on this program uh, specifically for today. And I want to thank you for that. Um, John was one of the first people that took a look at the beginnings of a blueprint of, of the program, trying to imagine another kind of design education. John also has an ex-school um, initiative that he does around the world in a kind of uh, alternative design education that maybe you can speak about um, f for, for a little bit. Anyway, extraordinarily grateful that you're here. Very happy that you finished another book, because I know how hard it is to finish books. Um, and a, a huge welcome uh, to you, John Thackeray. Alan is one of those wonderful people who always asks you painful questions. And one of the ones he asked me not two days ago is, how long did it take you to write this book? And I hadn't actually thought about it until that moment. And then it came. I said, oh my god, it's five years. And it's quite a short. It's not very long. And you may find that five years is a very long time to deliver something so slight. But actually, part of the work was making it slight, because my previous books have been kind of very wonderful, but rather heavy going. So and it's one of the, I'm one of those writers who it's very hard for me to kind of make it easier and lighter to read. So I've worked hard on that. But thank you for that difficult question, Alan. I've, got, I've given my talk a curious title, but I hope it'll become clear during the day, um, the hour, that uh, I want to first begin with a health warning. That if you've never thought of bioregions before and think this doesn't sound like my cup of tea, be reassured you are in the vast majority. I'm proposing something, namely a word for, called bioregion, which is about a new way of thinking about place-based design and the multitude of different things that we're all involved with um, in the framework of uh, what does a leave things better economy mean in practice? Not just as a concept, but how do we turn all these words that are flying around about what the future needs to be into practice? And since you're designers of a, of course, radically new type, I'm hoping that you can, in the questions and so on afterwards, uh, help me make it clearer. So there's four parts. Um, firstly, uh, although it is my work is sort of optimistic, it's within the framework of a reformed Duma that I think it's necessary to have a brief reminder to ourselves of why things are febrile in the world and that it may seem calm at this particular moment in the favor. And I didn't, I had no idea what you were saying, to be honest, that this, you will recognize this from Hunger Games, is the guy is welcoming people to take part in the games where everybody will die except one person and saying how lucky they are to be in it. That's what my young companion thought when seeing the billboard for Transganga High Tech City. And then I got back on my journeys and took me to London. And uh, this is George Osborne, who is called the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's like this number two guy in the British government. And they are themselves, just like in India, launching and making a big song and dance about the sheer scale of the construction and infrastructure projects that they are committed to using the language that this is not just about the self-interest of me in the short term, but about these fundamental rights of the future generation to a better world caused by and represented by these big infrastructure projects. I'm not prepared to turn around to my children and say, I'm sorry we didn't build for you. I kind of think he should, should say, I'm not prepared to turn around to the construction industry and say, oh, sorry we didn't build to you. But anyway, that's me being a cynical person. But he's true to his word, and here in the center of London is one of the already underway projects. It's called uh, Crossrail. This is like 100 yards from where I used to have an office in, in London many years ago. 
a, an extraordinarily brilliant piece of technology, engineering, planning, not to mention clever financing, public-private uh, partnerships, and so on. Uh, the whole city is kind of in uproar as they build this high-speed train right through the center of this very old city. And at no point now, then, or in the future has anybody said, why do, is it necessary to bring the farthest corners of the country closer to the center of the city with such an expensive thing? It's just absolutely not part of the debate about whether this is a desirable way to reorganize space and time. It's just, well, it must be good because it creates jobs. It creates holes in the ground. We are building for our future. And so I, although I'm being sort of cynical and I'm rude about it, and I think it's, to me, obvious that uh, massive infrastructure projects are not the way to create a better future, particularly those hard ones, I do think we have a responsibility to the next generations of Mr. which Mr. Osborne was speaking to say, okay, well, if we're, if we're critical or skeptical that heavy infrastructure is a, what we're building for, what is our alternative? What can we give to those guys by way of a, a description of what a better future will mean that is not the traditional and very sad description of what things that are green or sustainable or resilient or transitional, it always sounds small, feeble, sad, and not generally inspiring. So the basic framework for the book and for my work and generally is that we do have to be a bit more um, responsible for creating a, uh, not, a, not a, an image, not a vision, not a utopian fantasy, but a practical description of what a better work will be, a better world will be like, so that all these follower generations will actually be turned on and transform the, the details of it. Um, to our amazement. And I think the elements are there. So that is why I think a new story is needed. We need a new story which is as evocative and as exciting as infrastructures and rails and high-speed trains and large, shiny and expensive things. The general subject of reconnecting with place, of finding out qualities of where we live and exist that have become ignored or we've been distracted from paying attention to them, is an essential part of what the new story can be and what I'm going to tell you about in my, in my examples. A second part is the fundamental need but also excitement of reconnecting cities with the places from which their um, resources come. The notion that uh, the hinterland, the, dis the, the fields, the river systems, the uh, the lands upon which cities depend for their next lunch, but we don't, cities don't think about, that reconnection is unavoidably uh, going to be part of a resilient future. But the point is that reconnection needs to be more than just an ideological one or a cosy idea. How do, do we reconnect the city and all of you guys living for the most part in it with the natural systems upon which we depend for our next lunch, not to mention our whole lives? Well, that's a whole pile of interesting questions which I can come on to. But then thirdly, it's not just about a romantic wish to reconnect with the countryside, it's transforming our understanding of what is the built and what is the natural world. And that's one of the big transformations in the environmental movement is this final acceptance, learning from science as well as some wisdom traditions that cities are part of nature too. Just because we're living in cities doesn't mean to say we're not living in nature, it's just that we're living in a different aspect of nature. So when we talk about transforming cities for the better and making cities healthy and making uh, cities um, more connected to their resource bases, this does not require us to kind of sever all routes and then head off to some damp and unpleasant farm somewhere. It's something that happens here and